story of how God was seeking a bride for his son. Each book is different from every other book. I'm trying to give you the keys for you to unlock it for yourself. Well, let's press on with Ezekiel. We've looked at the first section, chapters 4 to 24, which are entirely about Jerusalem and the ultimate obliteration of the city, which the Jews didn't believe would happen. But Ezekiel keep, kept saying, it will happen, and when it does, then you will know that I am the Lord. Now we move on to this middle section, which he prophesied when he was 36, 37 years of age. So there's a gap of a few years between the first section and the second. You see, as soon as Jerusalem fell, all the neighboring countries were thrilled to bits. I don't know if you know the origin of the phrase hip, hip, hooray. Hip, H-I-P are the three initial letters of Jerusalem is fallen. And I'm afraid it was an originally an anti-Semitic celebration. Jerusalem is fallen, hip hip, hooray. And I'm afraid that spoiled that for me. I can't say it now because that's its origin. And I'm afraid that's what all the nations around Jerusalem were saying. Hip hip, hooray, Jerusalem is fallen. We're rid of these Jewish people. And I'm afraid they took advantage of the Babylonian invasion, the Edomites, the Ammonites, they, they did horrible things to the people who were left. And that explains the bitterness in some of the Psalms. Remember Psalm 137? You know, it, it comes out of Babylon, we hanged our harps on the willow trees. How shall we sing the songs of Zion in a strange land? They wanted to hear our music in Babylon, but how can we sing? When we're away from Jerusalem, may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth and my right hand lose its cunning. Run, sing the songs of Zion in a strange land. Then it finishes up with this bitter cry, happy shall he be who dashes your little ones against the stones. And I'm afraid they were taking babies by the ankles and smashing their brains out against the walls of Jerusalem. It, it's a cry from the heart. Will somebody treat you the way you treated us? And the middle section of Ezekiel's prophecy is all about God paying back these surrounding nations for the exploitation of the fall of Jerusalem. And some of the predictions are incredible in their detail. Let's just take one. It's in these chapters that Ezekiel predicts the downfall of Tyre. Now Tyre was a fishing port on the eastern coast of the Mediterranean and half a mile offshore there was an island but the town of Tyre was on the mainland and it was a fisherman's town and Ezekiel predicts that one day Tyre will be raised to the ground and, it's, and all of this city will be thrown in the sea and that the place where Tyre stood will be a place for fishermen to dry their nets that's an extraordinary thing because no city in the entire history of the world has ever been thrown into the sea, ever, either before or since. But Tyre was. When Alexander the Great came marching down towards Egypt with his great army, the people of Tyre simply got into their fishing boats and went out to the island half a mile offshore, knowing that Alexander had an army but not a navy. But they didn't uh, realize that Alexander wasn't called the Great for nothing. And when he saw the people on the island thinking they were safe, he just said, throw the town into the sea and build a causeway out to the island. And they took every brick, every stone, every piece of timber and threw it in the sea and made a causeway out to the island and he went out and dealt with them. And if you look at the map now, Tyre is out on the island and in fact the sand has silted up against Alexander's causeway so that the coastline is no longer straight with an island offshore. It now goes like that. And Tyre is out here. And if you go to the site of old Tyre on the mainland, it's bare rock and there are fishermen's nets to this day spread on the rock. Now that's the one that the chances of that happening are one in 75 million. But Ezekiel said that's what would happen. See, centuries before it did. And uh, he predicts 
what will happen to Egypt. He predicts what will happen to all those neighbours of Judah and it always did. There are predictions about Ammon, Moab and Edom in the east and if ever you've been to Petra or seen pictures of Petra, you were looking at Mount Seir. Do you realise that Edom is Esau? Yes. And it goes way, way back to the old Jacob Esau thing, just as the Ishmael Isaac is today the Arab-Israeli conflict. You need to understand history to understand the Middle East. It uh, mentions Philistia on the west of Judah, Tyre and Sidon on the north and Egypt on the south. In fact, he boxes the compass in this middle section and he says, when these things happen to them, then they will know that I am the Lord. Now that middle section is fairly straightforward so we don't need to look at it, except that there is one man singled out in that middle section as an example of supreme pride, the king of Tyre. And uh, many people have seen in that chapter about the king of Tyre a picture of Satan's pride and it's not a coincidence. There is a relationship between the devil and the king of Tyre's sheer pride. The king of Tyre said, I am a god. Pharaoh did much the same and one of the statements of Pharaoh mentioned here is incredible. The Pharaoh of this time said, I made the Nile. Well, he may have uh, dug some of the ir irrigation channels, but he says, he said, the Nile is mine, I made it. See, now when man gets to the point of pride where he thinks he's God and that he created everything, that's the ultimate pride and you can't do that in God's presence and get away with it. God will not stand human pride. It is the ultimate sin to set yourself up as if you're God. It's what Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden. They wanted to be like God. Amazing that when they were already in the image of God but they wanted to be like God in power and authority and not just in character. Now I'm going straight through that section because it's very straightforward, there's little to explain and I'm not doing your Bible study for you in these talks. I want to get you into the Bible. I'm just trying to cope with the difficult bits and give you keys to unlock those. So we move on, Jerusalem is destroyed, 587 and now there is a complete change in Ezekiel's preaching. From pessimism it changes to optimism. Mind you, this was pretty good news for Judah but now we have really good news and we have the return from exile in Babylon. We're going home. Something about that gets you, doesn't it? We're going home. Isn't it awful when you're taken to hospital and your clothes are taken away? You feel, that's it, I'm cut off. <laughs> and then isn't it great when the doctor says you can go home today? Somehow going home has all, in, all of it in it. So let's look now at this uh, good news. Very positive, very optimistic, good news. And that is why chapters 33 to 39 are so popular. They're full of good news. Chapter 33, however, is an important chapter. It talks about watchmen. Now, a watchman is someone who stands on the walls of a city and day and night he's watching the horizon and his job is to warn the city if any threat comes. And God says to Ezekiel, that's your ministry really. I've appointed you a watchman. And the cost of being appointed a watchman was this, if a sentry did not spot an enemy coming then he forfeited his life. That's a capital crime. I heard of a British army soldier who was on sentry duty at a camp and, and he was standing up in the sentry box and he leaned against it and he went to sleep. And he opened his eyes and realised the commanding officer was standing in front of him. <laughs> so he closed his eyes and he said, Amen! <laughs> and uh, his commanding officer said, good man, carry on. <laughs> well, I think he really ought to be given a medal for uh, initiative <laughs> and for thinking on his feet. But you see, if you're a sentry and you fall asleep or if you're a sentry and you don't see danger coming, then you forfeit it with your life. And a watchman, God said, 
If you don't warn my people, then you pay for it with your blood. But if you warn them, there is no more responsibility on you. They pay for it with their blood if they ignore the warning. That's the cost of being a watchman. And one of the best known passages in Ezekiel is where God says, I looked for even one man who would fill the gap. I couldn't find one. But Ezekiel was his man. Ezekiel, of course, was not in Jerusalem. He was away in Babylon. But he was a watchman. And when he saw trouble coming, it was his responsibility to warn the people. And if he didn't, he paid for it with his blood. So, in a sense, he had no choice but to go through this costly ministry. He would be held responsible if he didn't. Well, now, the chapter 34 is all about the good shepherds and the bad shepherds and says Israel's had bad shepherds and that covers both prophets, priests and kings. They were all, in a sense, in the care or should have been caring for Israel but didn't. Bad shepherds. And at the end of that chapter, God says, I will be their good shepherd. That's taken up by Jesus again, isn't it? I am the good one. When Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd, he's contrasting himself with bad shepherds. If you're the good one, there must be bad ones around. And again, when Jesus talks about the good shepherd in John 10, he's, he's lifting a whole lot straight out of Ezekiel chapter 34. That's the real problem. The Bible never blames the sheep for the state of the flock. And that's a principle that applies to churches too. The shepherds are responsible for the state of the flock, not the sheep. And therefore it was the leaders of Israel who primarily are held responsible for the state of the nation. Chapter 37, to jump a little ahead, dem bones, dem dry bones, everybody knows about the bones, especially because of all the songs that have been written and sung. But very few go on to the two sticks, and yet those are just as important. Ezekiel was told, get hold of two sticks and then hold them in one hand side by side, which he did. But it, first of all, God said, write Ephraim on one, which had become the popular name for the northern ten tribes, and write Judah on the other, the name for the two tribes in the south. Hold them together in your hand and you will find that they become one stick. Some people think it was a vision. I think it was a straight miracle rather like Moses' rod. But uh, he held them together, became one stick, and God said, I'm going to make one people again, and I will be their shepherd. That's why Jesus talks about um, other sheep I have which are not of this flock. I'm going to bring them all together, and there'll be one flock and one shepherd and one fold. It's all out of that chapter 37. Go on to the sticks, remember that. And a few years ago, I had a little vision. I saw two sticks, but they weren't held side by side. There were two sticks held end to end uh, with two hands, and on one was written charismatic, and on the other was written evangelical. I saw them become one in God's hand. That's how my book, Fourth Wave, was born. That's some years ago, and it's taken some years for the book to come to fruition, but it'll be out at the end of this month. There's a little commercial. <laughs> The two sticks become one in God's hand. In chapter 38, we have a strange prophecy of the future that has never yet been fulfilled. And so here we're on the borderline between present and future. It's about Gog and Magog. And don't ask me what it's all about, because <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. When it happens, I'll tell you what it means. <laughs> But those two names are picked up again right at the end of the book of Revelation. And it's obvious that it hasn't been fulfilled yet, that some, some great conflict is coming out of the north. We don't know where or who. It's one of those things we'll have to wait and see. But Ezekiel again was looking through the telescope into the distant future. And he never saw this fulfilled and we've never seen it fulfilled. One day it will be because there is going to be final conflict before history winds up. Throughout all these chapters, 
the most interesting refrain that comes again and again and again, altogether 77 times, are two little words. I wonder if you could guess what they are. They've been called the longest sentence in the English language. And many of you have said it. I will. I will. That's the longest sentence in the English language. It's a life sentence. <laughs> See? Ah, oh, you're with me now. It's part of the marriage service. And you don't say, I feel like it. You say, I will. It is a covenant phrase. And this phrase, I will, comes 77 times in just these chapters. I will bring you home. I will be your God. I will give you good shepherds. I will, I will, I will, I will. Here is God the husband talking to his wayward wife and saying, we're still married and I still keep my side of the covenant. I will, I will, I will. Hope you mark your Bibles. If you do, whenever you see I will, just mark it there. And there's this tremendous sense of God's total commitment to his people after all they've done and even after he's wiped them out. You see, way back at the beginning at Sinai, when God made his covenant with Israel, he said a very interesting thing. He said, you're going to break this covenant, but I never will. So he says in Deuteronomy, there will be times when I have to throw you out of the land I promised you, but I will always bring you back. And they're back in that land today. But listen, that doesn't mean that they don't have to live right. We don't support Israel unconditionally. She's still accountable to God for righteousness and how she deals with aliens and strangers within her borders. God is God. He could throw them out again, but he would always bring them back. That's his I will. And when God says I will to you, that's precious. I will, I will. And when God brings them back home after throwing them out, then the nations will know that I am the Lord. Because it happens so publicly and everybody knows. They're back. And still the surrounding nations may not like it, but they're back. And God has brought them back. They are still his people. Read Romans 9 to 11. They may have rejected God, but he hasn't rejected them. God isn't like that. He hates divorce. That comes out so clearly. And now finally, I want to come to the last section, which in a sense is the most difficult to understand. And I'm going to leave you with questions rather than answers. Chapters 40 to 48 are a quite new kind of prophecy. And they're in the 25th year of his exile, Ezekiel is very careful to date everything he says so we can reconstruct it and fit it in to its historical background. If the Bible gives dates for a prophecy, it's very important. It means that you must fit that word into the history to understand it. Some prophecies are timeless, uh, but some prophecies are very timely and need to be fitted in. When he was 50, he was given a vision of the future entirely centered on a new temple. This is at a much later stage of the exile, much nearer they're going home, and all of it is good, just as the first big section of Ezekiel is all bad, this is all good, and it is to give them hope. That's the most neglected Christian virtue, actually. Now abideth faith, hope, and love, and the most neglected of these is hope. And I hear a lot of preaching about faith and love today, but very little about hope. That's one of the reasons I made the uh, video, The Final Facts. We're losing sight of the future, becoming obsessed with the present. And we are the people of hope, we're the people of tomorrow. And the Bible is full of hope for the future. And Ezekiel was not allowed to finish preaching to the exiles without filling them with hope. 
with something to look forward to. As certain as they'd been thrown out of the promised land, they would be put back into it. They may have been disciplined, but they have not been destroyed. God will never allow his people Israel to disappear. Heaven and earth may pass away, but Jesus said this race will not pass away. And it hasn't. It's one of the proofs that the God of Israel is real. You can't destroy the Bible for it's God's book. You can't destroy Jesus because he's God's son. You can't destroy the Jews because they're God's people. See, God has communicated his eternity to whatever he touches. You can't destroy what belongs to God. Now the most serious loss to the people and particularly to Ezekiel, he felt it personally, was the loss of the temple. God's house. That seemed to be the end because they had always thought whatever else may be destroyed, God would never let his own dwelling place on earth be destroyed, yet it had gone. And that was probably the most devastating thing that had happened. And as I've said, they had to meet in synagogues from then on and still do because they don't have the temple now either. Now in chapter 40 to 42, you've got the building of the temple <coughs> described in incredible detail. The rebuilding is to be given an architectural plan. Now let's just show you a few things. Here's the architectural plan of the new temple. Uh, an architect uh, gave me that and uh, it is a grand, grand temple. You could actually fit about 13 English cathedrals into that area. I'll give you some idea. It is an enormous plan, most elaborate, all the rooms and the porches and as far as a modern architect can do, that's a picture of it. Quite different from Solomon's far bigger and Solomon's was big enough, but some rather interesting features, no Holy of Holies, no Ark of the Covenant, no Table of the Showbread. These have been lost of course by now. And in chapter 43 he sees the glory come back into the temple. He has a vision of the, the thing lighting up again. As it did after Solomon completed the temple, they prayed and the glory came in and they saw the whole thing lit up inside. So bright they had the veil to cover it. It would have blinded people. But the glory came and Ezekiel had seen the glory depart from the temple. Now he sees the glory come back into it. It's a very exciting chapter. There is an altar and there are sacrifices but chapter 44 says there's no high priest. Now that's very significant because when the Jews did go back from exile, they did have high priests and when Jesus came there was a high priest, Caiaphas. Now in Ezekiel's vision of the future there's no high priest and his place is taken by a prince. That's very interesting. The prince occupies that highest of all position, a prince who is a priest but he's basically the prince, the king. And the only priests in the vision are sons of Zadok, Ezekiel's family. <laughs> now I'm sure that's not just his flesh getting in the way of the vision, but uh, God is saying, you've got to have the right priests. Chapter 45, the whole land is divided between the tribes but in quite a different way, in sort of horizontal strips from north to south quite a different division. Then there is the restoration of offerings and holy feasts and days which we saw when we looked at Leviticus with the exception of Pentecost. There's no Pentecost in the new calendar. Again, I'll leave you to think that through. Then in chapter 47 is that vision of a new river in the Middle East. The only real rivers in the promised land, there are two big ones flowing into the Mediterranean from the Judean hills but there's this amazing river that starts nowhere and finishes nowhere called the Jordan running down the deepest crack in the earth's surface, a crack which goes right down through Africa, through Tanzania, right down the Great Rift Valley is all part of that 
crack, but the deepest point of the crack and the lowest point on the surface of the earth is Jericho in that crack and there is the Dead Sea and the River Jordan flows into it and finishes. And the evaporation of the heat down there, about 1600 feet below sea level, it is tropical and the evaporation has caused the salt content to rocket up to about 28%. That's why you can sit on top and read a book. Any of you done that? Great fun. It's very dangerous if you dive in, you stay upside down. You can't get your, you can't get your feet down under you because your feet are like ping pong balls on the surface. And there it is. Now I'm telling you all that because here in the vision he sees a new river whose spring source is right under the temple up in Jerusalem. And any source of water that starts there has to flow into the Dead Sea. The own Jerusalem is surrounded by hills, but there is one opening in those hills to the southwest of the city and it heads straight down to the Dead Sea. It's the Kidron Valley, mostly dry today. But rain finds its way down that valley to the Dead Sea, but he sees a river going down that valley and, and more and more tributaries joining the river so that it gets deeper and deeper. And a man wading down the river will find himself soon out of his depths and having to swim. He sees a whole new river and he sees the river entering the Dead Sea in the region of Angedi, which is halfway down the western bank. It's the place where David hid in the caves from Saul, if ever you go there. And uh, there's a wonderful waterfall and caves around it. And as soon as you see the place, you can see the visual images that are enshrined in the Psalms. And he sees this fresh river freshening the Dead Sea and he sees the fishermen of Galilee coming down to the Dead Sea to fish. And there are fishermen at Angedi and the whole thing becomes alive again. It's no longer the Dead Sea, it's a fresh live sea where fishermen come, where people can live. The, the whole vision is, is a dream if you like. It's a dream to fill the people with hope. It's going to be different going to be different. And then finally we have uh, in the last chapter the gates of the city re-erected and uh, the land at peace and prosperity, everything wonderful. Now then, the question you're all dying to ask, or maybe you're not. One thing is absolutely certain, this temple has never been built. When they came back, the temple they managed to build was a poor little thing. In fact, one prophet had to go to them and say, don't despise the day of small things. It was just a poor little temple that they managed to build when they came back from their exile. And that has never been built. So the question remains, well, when will it be fulfilled? Furthermore, they never got a prince back. When they came back, sorry I told you Zerubbabel was the high priest, it wasn't, it was Joshua, wasn't it? A man called Joshua, Zerubbabel was the governor and the high priest was Joshua when they came back. But they never got a prince again. They tried at one stage under the Maccabees to be independent and set up a sort of semi-royal line but it didn't last. By the time Jesus came there was no king except for King Herod, an Edomite a descendant of Esau. And in order to try and butter up the Jews and get on their good side, Herod rebuilt this little temple. He said, I'll build you a bigger one than that and Herod could build pretty big buildings. You go to Masada and see his palace. <coughs> but to try and please the Jews, he said, you don't want a little temple like that. I will build you one grander than Solomon. And he did. Now, we have no photographs of it, but there is a model of it outside Jerusalem. If you go to Jerusalem, go to the Holy Land model as it's called. It's in the grounds of the Holy Land Hotel, not from, far from the Knesset. And uh, you can see the whole city of Jerusalem in the day of Jesus built in stone. It's fascinating, I'm sure some of you have seen it. And the temple comes up to about your thigh. There's, there's the temple, you can just see the Solomon's porch and you can see the uh, temple itself with the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place right in there. That's a, a rather poor photograph of the temple in the model, looking from the Mount of Olives down into the main temple, the two pillars 
and then leading through with the veil inside and so on. And it's worth seeing that. But that again was not built on the plans of Ezekiel's vision. It was uh, Herod's architect idea. It did incorporate some of Solomon's ideas into it, but it was quite different. It was this temple. I mean, a man's height would be the width of my finger here. It was enormous. And it was this temple that was still being built when Jesus came. It wasn't even finished. And the stones of the temple, uh, you can still see some of them in what's called the Wailing Wall. It's now called the Western Wall. If you ask the Jews where the Wailing Wall is now, they will direct you to the income tax office. <laughs> um, they've, trans they've transferred the name and they call this the Western Wall. The Western Wall is not the wall of the temple, it's only the foundation. It's only the platform that straddles the ridge. They, there's a, it's built on the ridge of a hill, but the artificial platform goes out like that and it's the edge of one of those walls that you see. And there are stones there 40 feet long by three feet high, by three feet deep, that weigh a hundred tons. And they were carved without the sound of a hammer or chisel. And uh, if you go under the hill into a big cave right underneath, you find the soft rock from which these huge stones were cut. You can cut them with your fingernail, you can cut them with a pen knife. And then you bring the block out and it oxidizes in the air and goes hard. And that's how they managed to build the temple without ever the sound of a hammer or chisel. It's all cut underground with knives and then brought out and oxidized and built up. Well, it's a magnificent sight, but Jesus said not one stone will be left standing on another. And you say, but the Wailing Wall is still there. Ah, but that's not the temple. He said not one stone of this will be left standing on another. Recently, only recently, archaeologists have found the stones of this temple in a great heap at the southwest corner where they've excavated. And the disciples were amazed isn't even finished. Well, it was hardly finished when the Romans pulled the whole thing down in AD 70 and what Jesus predicted came absolutely true. Well, so is it ever going to be built? Well, some people say it's, it's not literal, it's a prophetic vision and it was not intended to be built, it was just to give them hope. That's one way. Another possibility is that what God wanted them to do was to build that temple and they just ignored Ezekiel's plans and built their own version which they thought they could afford. I'm quite sure that God would have financed the big thing if they'd had the faith to do it, but they didn't. So we could say it was what God intended but never was. Another possibility is that it's yet to be built in the future and there are many Christians are convinced of that, either that it will be rebuilt by the Jewish people before Jesus gets back or that it will be rebuilt in the millennium. I'm going to have to say, I really don't know. I'm going to wait and see. <laughs> One thing I'm absolutely sure of is this, I have got God's plan for his dwelling place on earth. Um, that was Ezekiel's plan, inspired by God, yes, but actually that was God's plan. That was God's plan, you see, and uh, it's a very interesting architect's plan. You should come and study it more closely, but that is God's plan for where he was going to dwell on earth. Perhaps you might see it better if it's uh, <laughs> that way up. That's God's plan and that was his temple on earth and that's where God tabernacled among men. Some of you are still peering at it. It's a bit far for you. You better, better come nearer and have a look at it. It's a good plan. But uh, you are the temple of God now. And God dwells not in temples made with hands. That's said twice in the New Testament. He dwells in people. We are his temple. Whether Ezekiel's temple will actually ever be built or not, I do not know. So I leave that with you but it was the dream that kept the hope alive in the exiled people of God that one day they'd get back and everything would be wonderful. And if all that comes literally true, it'll be marvellous, won't it? But I'm going to wait and see. Being very frank there, we can spend a lot of ink over this and get distracted from being the temple of God today ourselves. So why read Ezekiel? 
Well, let me just finish the talk by saying it tells us about God. It tells us first that God judges his own people and we need to remember that. Judgment begins at the house of the Lord. Too many Christians think as soon as you've, you've believed in Jesus, that's judgment finished. Far from it. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. God judges his own people and he judges them by higher standard than others. We need to remember that. Secondly, we need to remember that God takes vengeance. We don't need to. Very important that. That if people mistreat us, if people are unkind to us, if they tease us, if they persecute us, if they kill us, we never need to try and pay them back. God will do that and you can leave it safely in his hands. Just remember that when somebody's treating you badly. Feel sorry for them. Don't feel angry with them because God's going to pay them back. So you should feel sorry for them. Pray for those who persecute you. Bless those who curse you. God will deal with them. You don't need to. People will think Christians are soft because of that, but we're not. It's just that we believe in God. Thirdly, God will always restore his people. Just as Israel will never disappear from history, the church will never disappear either. You belong to the people of eternity. There will always be an Israel, there will always be a church, and one day there will be one flock under one shepherd. God's the God who restores his people. And finally, a great deal of what we've looked at in Ezekiel is picked up in the book of Revelation. One of the reasons Christians don't understand the book of Revelation is that they don't know enough about the Old Testament. Revelation quotes the Old Testament 300 times. You've got to know your Old Testament to understand the book of Revelation. It's another apocalyptic book, highly symbolic but it picks up the symbols of Ezekiel and uses so much out of Ezekiel that if you don't know Ezekiel, you'll just be puzzled by revelation. And that's an added incentive to Christians to study this amazing prophet. Above all, it gives you a view of God, his omnipotence, his power, his omnipresence, those wheels under the throne, moving any way he wishes and his omniscience, he sees everything, knows everything. That's the picture of God you get. And you get a, a tremendous sense of his holiness and the fact that he has tied his name to a nation, that his name rests in our hands. And therefore, of course, God had to bring them back to vindicate his name. And the one thing you can appeal to is God's name and God's reputation. Moses appealed to God. What will people think about you if you did that, Lord? It's a powerful argument with God. Appeal to his name. And you know, his name is now in your hands and in mine. And we either give God a good name or a bad name. But God will always vindicate himself. In the long term, God's reputation is at stake in his people. That's why he will restore them because he has to vindicate his name. He mustn't ever let the earth and the nations think that he's finished as God because his people are finished. That's why they never are finished. And he always restores them. Many may perish meanwhile, but the people will continue because they're the people of God.